So hello everybody. Um, I like to thank the the co-organizers uh, to to let me fill this slot here. Uh, what I would like. I don't want to start with the outlook. So I'm aware of the fact that I'm between uh, the lunch and uh, we have heard a lot of different uh, ideas so far. So I would like to take a little bit uh, a more higher level view on, on algorithmics in data science and then come to some uh, topic, some, some validation issue which we were looking for in the last couple of years and you might call it also Quo Vadis Artificialis Intelligentia. Uh, I think it, has, it relates to these issues but, but we are very far away from it. So we live in the time of data and we had these machines in the 50s and today we have these big centers. Uh, they are algorithms and they produce value. And I would like to point out that this mapping from data to value is a completely discriminative view which we are pursuing here. And we want to actually get under control how that value is generated out of data. In personalized medicine, what you see is you start with, you start with uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data, you annotate, you annotate this data, You annotate this data with information from the doctors. You generate knowledge out of it. That's a broken pathway for a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And then you generate value. And concretely, that value is the survival probability of the patient. And this costs you here. This costs you maybe 10 kilobyte. And you start out with 100 gigabyte. A a veritable challenge of our field is to identify those bits which have to be preserved on this pipeline. This is all what matters for the patient, for the doctors, for the insurance companies and so on. And if you miss this bit and you are classified as belonging to the green cohort but you belong to the red cohort, then chemotherapy might be ineffective on you and the last half year of your life is hell. So, so this is not an irrelevant bit. This is true value. And I'm not saying that you have to extend the probability of survival. It could be any other kind of measure you, you commit to. This is one of the challenges. So in essence, uh, if we use the, uh, the, the, the strategy of, of, of data science, you want, to you want to estimate a gigantic conditional probability where you condition on your, on your, mental, uh, on your health status and you want to estimate the probability of that value. And you might even uh, deal with interventions uh, by drugs in order to understand what you are doing in these types of pipelines. So the roadmap is I, I like to show you a concept uh, of uh, how to validate algorithms. Uh, there are some considerations which I think are non-standard. Uh, both for machine learning and uh, for, the, for the broader science uh, community. And they, they point towards the essential role of algorithms in this, uh, in this endeavor. And then I will talk about uh, uh, examples uh, if, if I get to this point. So random input implies random output. You see that here with this gene expression data, they are drawn from a probability distribution defined by your experiment. And the biologists tell us you should look at correlations. You convert this into a graph uh, picture. Then uh, biologists also like to know what the communities are. So you do your graph labeling, your coloring, and you find these communities. The question is, what algorithm should you use? Because this is an element of uh, um, uh, exploratory data analysis and people have cost functions for that and you cannot compare these cost functions because there is no absolute level of comparison. This is a problem. Many people consider, many people consider that actually an art and not a scientific question. We know that quite often you destroy the essential bits in the pre-processing of your data 
And then the, the, the fluctuations by choosing the wrong model later on in the pipeline are minor. But people tend to focus on where they can publish, and publishing on the pre-processing is usually much more difficult than publishing on the nice models which you invent later on. The problem is if you cannot measure the information loss relative to your goal, then it's arbitrary. It's basically believing that you are doing the right thing. So this, in philosophy, this is called epistemic uncertainty, and this is aleatory uncertainty. The output is a random variable drawn from this conditional probability distribution where you condition on the data. So algorithms in data analytics, you map from the input space X to the output space C. I used it because I was working on clustering for a long time. I use C as, as the clusterings. Uh, and, and X then returns, the algorithm returns then these, these terminal answer C button uh, of the algorithm. So that gives you a probability distribution over possible answers. So your, your answers of the algorithm uh, generate a distribution because you have, you have a distribution of your experiments. And if you, if you have typical results of that, that experiments, you should be actually robust against any kind of these fluctuations because an experiment is characterized by the signal. And I assume that the signal is stable, but the fluctuations are not stable. So the fluctuations tell me how precisely I can make a, a, a claim. Now the problem is why do we go to the terminal point of this algorithm? Maybe it's better to have a posterior which already regularizes your results. And then you would have a distribution over answers when you sample from this posterior and you take into account that, you, that you, the random data are, are uh, uh, distributed according to this probability. So there, I think, and that is sort of the design aspect, there are a number of core questions which come up in computer science but are more general for science. The first one is, Kolmogorov told us that algorithms with random variables as input compute random variables as output. It's a triviality in that sense if you believe in probability theory. But it's not paid attention to in a lot of design of algorithms. Shannon told us that algorithms have to compute typical solutions. You pay a high price for a guarantee against atypical solutions. And if you, if you, if you want to do that, you have to have good reasons. So in cryptography, you have good reasons because you have powerful, intelligent opponents. They might focus on these types of solutions. Nature is not malicious. So in, 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 the, in, the typical ca in, in the usual cases of machine learning, when you get uh, data from your random experiments, that should be taken into account. And when algorithms do generalize, that's, that's, a, that's an issue. They, 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 have to, they have to be robust against uh, uh, noise models and mismatch. So if we want to make the dream of artificial intelligence come true, then our algorithms have to autonomously improve their performance. So we have to know what the meta rule is in order to make progress on the resolution of the output space. So for those with a, with a notion of typicality, at least in computer science, it's not too widespread known. You have a, uh, imagine you have a random coin flip, 60% head, 40% tail. Uh, <coughs> which segments do you want to report? We can discuss for a long time why you actually should re want to report a sequence, but that is, a, that is a, a caricature of a situation in engineering. You have a random uh, uh, optimization problem and you want to report the, the, the best solution, the maximum likelihood solution. So the maximum likelihood solution gives you the all one sequence. It's a classical case where the most probable sequence is atypical and you should not report it. So from a computer science point of view, it's not at all clear what it actually means that your algorithm correct. I would say the algorithm which finds the global minimum and where the global minimum is atypical is wrong. So the correctness statement on algorithms have to be rethought in this context. So my claim is machine learning is not optimization. First of all, uh, you can't do what you want to do because you can't actually minimize the, the expected risk. You might 
what you can do might not be most relevant, and that's minimizing the empirical risk. And so I think what machine learning algorithms ultimately do is they localize solutions in the solution space. They pursue a metric goal to be repeatable under uncontrolled fluctuations on the input. This is a metric goal. Optimizing a cost function is sort of finding a good interpretation according to a partial order on your solution space, and that is a problem for the following reason. So we should pay attention to this localization. So why is it a problem? Because the standard setting says you have training data, you have validation data, you have test data, then you have a, a bunch of different cost functions, like in my, my gene, graph gene expression data uh, clustering problem, you have candidate models, which one should you choose? Every one of these candidate models gives you a conditional probability distribution, and then you sample from it. Which one to choose? So what people advocate is you evaluate your cost function on X double prime, on the validation data for solutions which you draw from your training data. So solutions which come from this probability distribution C given X prime. So training data solutions are checked on the validation costs. And then you choose the one which is, has the lowest, uh, the lowest cost. So that's the standard view and you use uh, optimization, stochastic optimization to to, to sort of robustify yourself. I think, and this is now sort of my summary for students, uh, it violates an important wisdom of modeling. You should use small numbers when you have large uncertainties. Cost functions exactly do the opposite. You give the largest value when you have the small, when you have the largest answer, uh, when you, when you have, when you are very far away from your from your uh, uh, target value, you use the largest number of your risk with all the uncertainties involved. And why is this a problem? Despite the fact that we are so successful in 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 the physical sciences with these concepts for 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 uh, yeah thousands of years, it's a problem for the following reason. If you don't know what the correct cost function is and you want to learn it from the data, assume this is now your risk function and this is the probability distribution I draw from it and I now want to know how precisely I should localize this probability distribution. Since this function is convex here, if I make this, this distribution more picky, what I gain on this side out, uh, compens overcompensates what I lose on this side. So there is a clear tendency to make it smaller and smaller and to go for the empirical risk minimization. So if I select models according to this concept, I have a bias which comes from the way I formulate the selection concept. And that's why I, I think we should go back to information theory uh, and, 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 and look what is done there. Now, in information theory, what you would do is look at the posterior on the training data, look at the posterior on the test data, and if they agree, sort of then the communication was robust, if they agree, it's good. And you sum all those solutions up which have exactly this property. It's kind of a, a cross-correlation experiment which tells you what is the right thing to do. Now, you might say, okay, this is arbitrary. Uh, Buhmann believes in this. The rest of the community believes in this. What do we care? Well, first of all, you get a nice maximum. Second, what you can do is you can now look into, into the sensitivity of these two criteria. So let's assume I can represent X prime, my training data, and X double prime, my validation data, by the, by the average of the data and the deviations. So I go in the center of mass coordinate system, if you like. And then I expand for small perturbations, for small fluctuations, these two measures. And the validation error is linear. And the score error is quadratic in the measure. Very simple because the score error is symmetric in the two components. 
So there is less sensitivity to the fluctuations in the posterior agreement, which you might call sort of a, a formalization of cross-correlation than in this validation error. So that's another argument. So the error minimization is more sensitive than score maximization. Computationally, we know that error minimization with convex functions is easier than doing maximization because these scores are non-convex. But they reflect better what is the situation in poorly modeled uh, areas of science where you have the chance to give me a local description but not a global one. So when, when we do genetic ana gene analysis, uh, two very similar um, uh, species can be nicely compared to two individuals on the same species even better. If you compare my genome with that one of the worm, it's up to guessing what the difference is. So we have very large uncertainties there. These uncertainties might be very unlikely in the inference, but they still in the model selection have their footprint. So, the, so, in the context of, of, of the usual uh, type of approach, maximum entropy, physics motivated, uh, you have a risk function, you go to the, to the Gibbs distribution as your posterior, you might actually make the temperature parameter time dependent as in simulated annealing, then you have this PT of C given X, and then you want to stop at the right time when you have the optimal resolution. So that, I think, is the challenge uh, in, in this context. And so the robustness uh, advocates the maximum entropy approach, but there might be situations where the algorithms actually are not following the maximum entropy trajectory and have still some advantages. If these advantages give you more stability, go for it. So here you see how this works on k-means clustering. I use k-means because it's easy to visualize. Uh, you have these pictures over everywhere. So the first split is in these three different clusters which correspond to the sources, but I use five different uh, 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 prototypical clusters in my hypothesis class, so at a certain level you get, uh, you get these bifurcations up here, and this is primarily random fluctuation driven. So this is the overinterpretation uh, due to the lack of stability. But it's not only stability. Uh, for, for, for a number of years, almost a decade, I believed in stability. But it's only one part of the, of the equation. The richness of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the hypothesis class and uh, the, the, the versatility of your algorithm to exploit this richness is the other side. And obviously, an algorithm which gives you a much more informative uh, answer should be given more credit with respect to errors. So the stability is relative to how much you want to say. Okay, so, so in the next two slides, I, I sketch graphically how this information theoretic approach goes and uh, how it actually follows the concept which, which, which I'm advocating, and it uses only indirectly cost functions via the Gibbs distribution because that converts the cost function with this tremendous increase in, in, in the values into a score function which squeezes these large deviations from, what, from your target values between zero and epsilon. So I have a data space, I have a hypothesis class, I map my, my graph here, into labeled uh, sets, subsets of vertices. Uh, and if you, if you look what's happening, this is my probability distribution for my gene expression data. Uh, and uh, I map it down to a distribution in the output space. But the real question is, this distribution here is a function of this algorithm. How broad should it be? That's essentially the question. Should it be more narrow? Should it be wider? Let's assume that this is the right size. Now I need alternatives. You might do a permutation test or you might do something else. So assume that we know a set of transformations which shift this distribution over here. Now you map the, this distribution to the output space with your algorithm, you have a representative here. And you do this m times and you get the coverage. 
So I leave it open for the moment what, this, this, what these transformations are, but they are, they are not supposed to touch my measurements. They are only supposed to change my representation of the output space, the hypothesis class, relative to the data space. So this is reality. I have my distribution, but I can only sample from that distribution. So this is an individual experiment, one graph. You map it to the output space. Let's assume we have a deterministic algorithm. This is the answer. You get three, you get two more samples. This is what you, are, what you get. I was advocating that only giving you one sample by such an algorithm is the wrong thing to do because this sample is, is, is a random variable. So you want to capture some, somehow the probability distribution. So let's assume we have this probability distribution in form of a Gibbs distribution if you have a cost function. That's it. Again, what is the right width? And these widths correspond to different algorithms. Again, we cover it, both input and output space. And now we need the test. That might be the permutation testing classification. So I get a second sample, the red sample here, from my distribution. That's the control experiment. I apply a random transform, I, I play one of these transformations which I have pre-selected. And I now map this sample which was effectively drawn from this distribution down here to the output space. And the decision process now is, can you recover the transformation when you get fresh fluctuations x double, uh, uh, x double prime for this control experiment? So, so the, the, the decoder sees only this uh, product of tau s applied to x double prime. And since this transformation is unknown and, and you have fresh fluctuations, you have now a way of probing what is stable between x prime and x double prime, and that's exactly the signal. It's not the fluctuations. So if my transformations resolve the output space so finely at such a, such a fine uh, resolution that uh, uh, you confuse the mappings due to these fluctuations, then you are overfitting. And that now gives me a, a quantitative criterion, which is, uh, which is the following. You take your output distribution on the validation data, that was the red distribution. You compare that with all the distributions which you generated by your different transformations. So this is the distribution on the uh, training data. And then you choose the transformation which maximizes this, uh, this quantity. And if you choose your transformations randomly, as in Shannon's random code book uh, idea, then you can build now an, an, an argument uh, how, to, how to derive a quantity which you should use as a scoring function for different models. So this is in, 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 in terms what you basically have to evaluate. The error event is whenever your estimator tau hat says, that it's different from tau s. So that's when you have recovered the wrong transformation. And the wrong transformation means you are in the overfitting regime. So you have to calculate the probability of error, and that uh, error should go to 0. So now I'm completely in the Shannon picture of, of how to derive a criterion. So here is the, 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 the different steps. Don't, uh, I, I don't want to go into it. Uh, the theorem uh, which we put together is the probability of an error is bounded by a quantity i, e to the minus a quantity i, minus the, the rate log m, and it has to go to zero. So what I'm after was not the communication protocol. What I'm after is this quantity, i. That's the one which I have to maximize in order to compare different models. So if an algorithm would like to improve itself, after the change of the algorithmic behavior, the i prime, the new i, should be higher than the old i. This is the score function. So the kernel, k here, so if you look at that function, it's the logarithm of the, of the, 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 the cardinality of the output space. I'm talking uh, discrete output spaces like the labelings in, in, in graph coloring. 
times a quantity which is between 0 and 1. This correlation measures how much the resolution of the output space is actually reduced. And it doesn't matter now in this picture how you calculate, uh, how you actually generate this correlation. You can have an algorithm which is guided by a cost function. You can have any other kind of algorithms as long as you can monitor how this algorithm is estimating its own uncertainty, and that's essentially the, the, the posterior probability distribution of the algorithm for your solution C conditioned on the experiment. That would be X prime or X double prime. As long as you can calculate this one, you are in business with this quantity. I, I know it's difficult, but that's what you expect from a, from a data science algorithm. It should know what the answer is, and it should know how, it's, how certain it is about the answer. And it has to give you this, uns this uncertainty about the answer, because the answer is a random variable anyway. So I think, and maybe this might be provocative, and I hope to, to steer a discussion, I think this is what we have to deliver. So posteriors should agree, I told you already that, and so, so the optimal posterior would be the argmax over this parameter t, where you look at the expectation over experiment, uh, the training and data set pairs, uh, 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 training and validation data set pairs of the logarithm of the cardinality of your solution space, so this is the, the, the output space of the algorithm, times this kernel which you, which, which you have to look at. The problem is you cannot evaluate it. But now I can basically ask, OK, what is the open challenge? The open challenge is to, to, to find now a set of algorithms which can be written as a, as, a, as a sequence of posterior probability distributions up to the point T star. And T star should then be the probability distribution with the best possible resolution. And I took this long-term, short-term memory uh, uh, a picture up there because uh, Schmidt-Huber claims that's the universal machine of learning algorithms. Okay, so I showed you this before. So the problem is we have to do something. So now we, I think we are in the, in the realm of standard uh, statistical learning theory where you say this expected quantity which, I should, which I'm supposed to maximize I, I have to lower bound with a sample average quantity minus a penalty. And so where do we stand uh, right now? I don't know what the penalty is, and we operate with L equals 1. That's the situation. And we get away with very good, at least with results which, which, which we could test, because the set of algorithms which we are exploring right now is very limited. <coughs> one parameter adjustment or maybe a, a, a couple of parameters. So let me give you, oh, so, so this is what you see. If the kernel for Gaussian posteriors, when they are very broad, these kernels, uh, they have very small value uh, when you multiply these curves and, and integrate over it. Here you have a maximum and here you are overfitting, you get again a small value. So you get a nice sort of uh, a maximum peak for the resolution of your Gibbs distribution. In some sense, if you, if you have read the book by uh, uh, Mesar and Montanari, one question which is open in that book is, uh, when, when they talk about learning, how do you determine the temperature of your learning machine given the input fluctuations? And that has to depend on the algorithm. So let me just show you. This is a pipeline for which we used it. Uh, it's in... in in uh, computational neuroscience, and it apparently has an impact on, uh, um, on, on um, research and also on, on, on treatment of uh, neurodegenerative diseases. I'm not a, a neurologist, uh, but uh, that's how this is used. You have M fMRI data, you produce diffusion weighted images, uh, 1 to 10 gigabytes, then you actually construct the diffusion tensors per voxel. You use a tracking algorithm, a fiber tracking algorithm, to go from voxel to voxel to see where the, where the diffusion pathways are, and you identify these diffusion pathways with the white matter connectivity. 
Then you try to find a clustering algorithm which uses this connectivity matrix and actually finds groups and then you map these groups back to the surface of the, of the brain. This, this is the challenge. The pipeline, again, as my first pipeline on cancer detection, has dozens of algorithms. And some people actually swear on their algorithms as if it would be a religious item. And, and the point is, these pipelines are hand-tuned by humans who have an intuitive understanding, but it's not quantitative. And it's way too complex in many applications to actually uh, see what's going on. So this has to be automated. And so let me, let me uh, briefly brush over it. Uh, the biology is mapped to a graph problem in this context. And uh, uh, if you look at a very, a very simple area down here, uh, you see that the capacity is first going up, and then it's going down, and, it's, and then it's breaking. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's breaking off here, and it corresponds to, to, to the point A here, where you only see a little bit of a separation, then you see a good separation, and then you th see the fluctuations. And the respective coloring down there tells you uh, uh, how the fluctuations kick through. You see it more clearly in, in this picture here. Ah, sorry. So. Hmm. No, I hope that. I have a problem to start the video. Let's see if it's working. No, the video d doesn't seem to, to run. So, so let me just explain. This is, this is what happens at the optimal resolution. When the, when the general capacity is maximal here, then you get this type of, of, of a partitioning in terms of this pipeline. And you should see the dynamics here, but, uh, uh, but that, that doesn't seem to work right now. OK, so what I like to emphasize is if you validate these types of, 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 uh, of, of information processing pipelines, there are two steps. There is the statistical validation, and then there is the scientific validation. The scientific validation actually means you have to make sure that the final value, which is, which is up to human decision, because the human is usually the, the user of these information processing uh, uh, results, the final value uh, has, to, has to be scientifically validated. But there is no point in scientifically validating a result which is statistically not solid. So I think uh, if you have the statistical validation, then we can auto autonomously improve these algorithms, and then we go in a direction which actually allow us to control these information processing pipelines. We might not understand, we might not understand the, 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 the true model which is represented by these algorithms because it's too complex, but we can control its reliability, and the reliability is coming from repeated uh, experiments. So, so how much time do I have? 50 minutes? OK, so, so, so let, me, let me come to, to a problem which, uh, which puzzles me a lot uh, because it relates statistical and computational complexity. So it's sparse minimum bisection, and uh, we are back in the camp of uh, optimizing cost functions. So what is sparse minimum bisection? And this is the work of Alex Kronsky. Uh, <coughs> and Wojtek Spankowski and, and, and master students. So, so what we have uh, is this graph. You select a, subgraph of the a subset of the vertices. And now I ask you to find a bisection on that subset. And contrary to the picture here, imagine 
that almost all the vertices are gray and only a few are yellow. So I, I look for a sparse bisection. Find the minimum bisection for this subset U, so this is the bisection here. And for the scaling, uh, uh, if we look at the cardinality of these subsets, the blue and the red one, to scale as n to the two seven, so that comes, the exponent comes out of the proof technique, uh, and uh, this is, so we conjecture that this is an NP hard problem. But it's more than an NP hard problem, it's also a spouse problem, so you first have to find the two subsets and then you calculate the bisection on that. So you have the optimization with a, with a detection problem mixed. And so what you want to do is, uh, you want to compare it with something, and this, the, the model I want to compare it with is the random energy model. So the random energy model for the purpose of search is actually very uninteresting because it by construction does not allow any search. You choose two to the n uh, different states randomly, and so you might have looked at two to the n minus one states and you still don't know what the global minimum is because it could be the last one. And you have no indication from the states you saw before because the last one is also statistically independent from all the others. So this is, uh, this is the remark on REM. We assume sparsity and there are two theorems. One says SMBP is upper bounded by REM for rescaled temperature. So to be precise, the free energy of SMBP is upper bounded by the free energy of REM. But it's also lower bounded by the free energy of REM. So what confuses me is the following. The free energy is a moment generating function for the probability distribution. Where should an algorithm find the evidence to search in the small, in the sparse minimum bisection problem when its free energy asymptotically is like the REM free energy and there you can't search? So that's the issue. There is no gap. So, so somehow, if, if you can search in sparse minimum bisection, but not in REM, a property which is not having any footprint in the free energy must help you for that. And I can't believe that this property exists. So at least this is, this is a direction to search and to use information theoretic uh, uh, ideas uh, to, 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 to make progress. And clearly this relates to uh, what Afonso was, was uh, telling us on, mo on Monday. It has to do with, 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 with hypothesis testing where it's possible uh, due to the sparsity of the, of the problems Many solutions are statistically independent from other solutions because they are, not, they are not sharing any input parameter to define the costs. Yeah. Sorry, Hawking. So, um, I can in principle uh, uh, get a, a model with the same free energy of the REM, but uh, where the assignment uh, of states to energies uh, allows me to find very easily a ground state. So the fact that you bound uh, the free energy of this problem with the one of the REM, uh, I'm not sure that it will so you be... Have, you have matching bounds, upper and me uh, lower matching bounds? Yes, of the but uh, I mean, uh, uh, my question is whether uh, the free energy uh, tells you something about search or not. I mean, it, I, I agree that the REM, you cannot search, but... Uh, the, the yeah, yeah, the question, okay. I don't think that the, that the, that the, that the answer is so simple, but uh, the free energy is basically a moment generating function for the probability distribution, and clearly the search is characterized by the probability, by the posterior probability distribution. Thank you. 
but the free energy, the 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 free energy is 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 the stochastic picture of a partial order of the states over the full configuration space. So so so. Okay, anyway. When so you have what we call the dynamical phase transition, you have a phase transition from a replica symmetric phase to a, a phase where the phase space is shattering an exponential number of, of states. Uh, that makes a big difference for dynamics, but the free energy just changes by epsilon. Okay? So you go epsilon below, epsilon above, the, 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 the free energy changes by epsilon, and the, and the and the configurational space is completely changed. So I don't see how you can relate so tightly the free energy value to the energy landscape, which in turn uh, con condition a lot the, the search algorithm. OK, so, so, so the theorem says in the asymptotic limit, it's the same. OK, but. Uh... So you wanted to stir a discussion, so. <laughs> you yeah, 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 yeah. I left physics some time ago, so it's clear that uh, uh, people people might have might know more about that. So, so what you what you can do is uh, uh, for for um, for the sparse minimum bisection problem, you choose a random instance x, and then you add noise to that random instance x, uh, and you get x prime. And uh, uh, you, you, you add some different random noise to that instance x, and you get x double prime. Now you have uh, the two different phase transitions. In the, in the high temperature phase, you see nothing. That's sort of the paramagnetic phase. In the phase where, uh, <coughs> in the phase where you have uh, uh, the, the middle phase, it shows you what is common between x prime and x double prime. And in the phase uh, uh, at very low temperature, you basically see the noise realization uh, between uh, uh, the differences between x prime and x double prime. And this is the picture. Depending on the signal to noise ratio, uh, you, you, you get, these, you get these, uh, these behaviors for the different values of this gamma. And gamma is the, the variance of, of x. And, uh, uh, and 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 uh, uh, sigma tilde here. So we also apply this to the community detection problem because the the, the minimum bisection problem has two complicated uh, combinatorics, and we hope to make progress on this problem uh, in the near future because it defines information radii in the solution space around a, po a potentially planted solution. So in some sense, what I just showed you is, is the planted solution is sort of the, 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 the signal. And uh, the noise which you add to it, which gives you the training and the validation data sets, uh, x prime, x double prime, that is the, that is, uh, the perturbations uh, which are unreliable from experiment to experiment. So OK, um, let me come to a. So, so I, I, I seem to get some more information, so maybe some of these questions are already, already answered. Uh, it might not be such a miracle, but I think uh, along these lines you can, uh, you, can, uh, you can make progress to understand the, the search complexity in these, in these uh, highly uh, randomized spaces with very localized planted solutions. Uh, now, let me get back to the, the more overview picture. Uh, we believe that, that learning machines have this performance uh, uh, because of uh, we imitate humans. And these are the pictures, the, the deep networks of the 90s from uh, uh, Jan Lequin, and this is how it looks today. And I don't have to show you how, how powerful they are. So you see it here. If you, if you look at this iClear paper here, and you want to you wanna hallucinate from, from, this, uh, from this cock to a vine of glass and back to the animal, uh, that's what you get in terms of trajectories. So the mimicking technology is enormously powerful, and it also works on flying objects. So, so, so that is very powerful. But what is missing? What is missing, and this is now philosophical, uh, uh, 
what is missing is the scientific method. And the and, and, and the, you see, the scientists don't need a blind dog guiding his way through research. We don't actually need the colleagues. Uh, they are helpful, but you can work on your own. And so the scientific method basically tells you, you ask questions, you propose hypotheses, you conduct experiments, you analyze the results, you go back at a certain point, you define a th theory and you go back. And so that is the Wikipedia version of the scientific method. And today we have algorithms at all of these edges. So if we don't learn how to validate these algorithms, we will not be in business of autonomous, autonomously generating knowledge. And this is the dream of artificial intelligence. That due to the repeatability of observations and conclusions on the real world, on experiments, we can build our internal hypothesis classes. So I think this is the open challenge which we face. And if we talk about the science of data science, then clearly this should be answered in some way or another. I'm not claiming that, this, that, uh, that the proposal I told you uh, is, is the ultimate answer on it, but it has to go along these lines. And the only theory I know which actually focuses on localizing solutions in the output space is, is information theory. Because when you can reliably localize, you have actually codes available and you can use these codes for communication. So the communication metaphor is just uh, 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 um, uh, an abstraction for, for, for making a decision process rational. And I agree with Tali, it should be rate distortion theory and uh, Helmut has pointed out uh, that there are uh, a lot of works from Kolmogorov and, and others which can be used, but this is this is, this is the challenge. And for the, for the statistical learning theory community, all these hypothesis classes we are talking about in combinatorial optimization have infinite VC dimension. So you cannot hope in the asymptotic limit that an individual solution is the right answer. You will always end up with a distribution. Okay, let me, why is this necessary? This is now a, a more a political, uh, uh, um, a political uh, slide, uh, which I find very nice, and I got it from Alessandro Curioni from IBM Research in, 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 in Rischlikon, uh, near Zurich. So this is what the Americans were dying of in, 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 in 2016. This is what the Americans actually looked on Google. You see which, which of the columns made most progress in, 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 in sort of attention, and which were decreasing. Well, everybody knows that burger eating is not good, so uh, it went down. Cancer is, is gaining in importance. What gained dramatically in importance is terrorism. The, 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 the danger was, small, was around 0.01%. And this is what the newspapers report on. So good are humans in estimating risks. And I think we need a technology in such a complicated world to help us because it's just too difficult. And we can't allow ourselves mistakes in very important questions these days. That's why I believe actually all this type of, 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 of research is absolutely fundamental for, for the future of humanity. So what is the outlook? Uh, algorithms are models of posteriors and they localize in the solution space. I hope I gave you some, um, uh, some indications why completely concentrating on cost functions is a dangerous thing. We have a case when you minimize Hemming distance as you do it in coding, then the concept which I showed you gives you the channel capacity of the binary symmetric channel. Minimizing, finding uh, uh, the right widths of your probability distribution for, uh, uh, for the Hamming distance in an in a, in a, in a out of sample uh, risk minimization setting gives you the wrong capacity. It gives you a higher value. And so you, get, you see already with these very simple cases that the concept is not getting close to general capacity. Learning requires validation of algorithms. I believe that this is, the, this is the ultimate challenge because we will have algorithms which invent algorithms. 
And obviously then understanding the algorithms as to some degree the, the, the GDPR, I think, uh, 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 no, what, what is it, the European uh, Data Protection uh, Law, is, is already outdated because we will never understand these algorithms if they are sufficiently complex problem solving. So, so I believe that the optimal resolution in the hypothesis class is something we should, we should actually determine for algorithms and I'm a strong believer that the scientific object to be investigated is the pair between an input distribution and the algorithm. This pair is the scientific object. It's not the algorithm in isolation. It also defines you something like structure-specific information because I only measure the input bits which matter for the output. Since the input space is much, much larger in most applications I know than the output space, you get something like a context-sensitive information measure which is, which, where the context is defined by your hypothesis classes. And I hope that, that, that it actually, alt, at one day, it relates statistical complexity to computational complexity. So I still have to sort out this, this, this puzzle with the free energies. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much.